The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in an attitude of prayer? Loving God, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to be in us. May we hear your voice this morning. Thank you for being with us on our life's journey in this, your world. Amen. Good morning again. The last two sermons that Pastor Josh shared with us encouraged us to find our spiritual gifts gifts and use them. As the display says, oh, I did it again. I am sorry. Sunday school and nursery. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Anybody else? I'm sorry. Mm. And guess what? I have a cheat sheet, and he even put it on there, dismiss the children. So I apologize. Anyway, Pastor encouraged us to find our spiritual gifts and use them. As our display says, do something. So this morning, I would like to share with you the spirits leading in my life over the past 71, almost 72 years. And the way the spirit is leading me into the future. Several years ago, a friend had encouraged a group of us to read the psalm corresponding to our age. With 150 psalms, we would not run out of chapters to read. Some of the psalms I've read since then have not been terribly uplifting. In some others, it was always easy to find praise and thanksgiving. This past year, I have been reading Psalm 71 for the obvious reason that it was my age. At the end of this month, I will begin a new Psalm. I would like to share with you some of the more meaningful verses that Psalm 71 has had for me. Like many people, I grew up hearing stories of when you were little. The more dramatic of the stories I was told was about the first days and weeks of my life. I was born prematurely with a couple of physical problems. My pediatrician was told by the specialists in Boston to let me die. I wasn't worth the battle. Obviously, he didn't listen. So to Dr. David Karp and the Lord, I am ever grateful. In verse 6, it says, from birth, I have relied on you. Oh my goodness, there it is. God was in charge, even then. Further along, verse 17 says, since my youth, you have taught me. This verse reminded me of the faithful pastors and missionaries who introduced me to Jesus and shepherded me in my Christian faith and walk. As a young teen, I attended a series of meetings led by the Dr. E. Stanley Jones, a retired Methodist missionary to India. In those meetings, Brother Stanley, as he preferred to be called, challenged us to listen to God calling us. As I listened, I did indeed hear and feel God calling me to follow him in my life. So a thank you to Brother Stanley. In October of that same year, our church was assigned a new pastor. Now, those of you who are familiar with the Methodist denomination know that having a change of pastor in the fall is pretty unusual. However, God had plans for our congregation when the Reverend Willis Miller was sent to our church. He was a guiding force for many of us teens as we navigated the trials and pitfalls of being in middle and high school. For me personally, he was a mentor as I continued to listen to God in my life. Willis was a graduate of a small Christian liberal arts college in the bluegrass region of Kentucky, Asbury College, now Asbury University. I decided that I would attend Asbury, but I wouldn't marry one of those preacher boys from the seminary across the street. More on that in a bit. Both Brother Stanley and Willis followed the call of Jesus on their lives, influencing unknown numbers of people to join in the task of telling others about our risen Lord. I am grateful that God put both those men in my life. 
Just before I left Massachusetts for college in Kentucky, Willis had a meeting of Asbury alumni and entering students. While we were in that meeting, a phone call came telling the group that an Asbury grad, Burley Law, missionary to the Congo, had been killed. That was a time of great upheaval in Congo. Burley's death brought home to me the cost of following God's call on my life. Once at Asbury, I began taking elementary education classes. At the beginning of my junior year, the thought of student teaching terrified me. I went to the academic dean with a request to change my major to straight math. Dean Reynolds said, Sarah, I believe God wants you to be a teacher, but I'm going to allow you to change to math. My plan, my plan, was to apply to IBM and hide. <clears throat> Little did I know that God would certainly change my life a few years down the road. Later that same year, a series of events led to my meeting Gary Parker, one of those preacher boys from across the street. Right away, we didn't like each other. I was in a Joni Baez mode, that kind of dates me, and he, after all, was a preacher boy from across the street. Well, again, God was in control. I had not shared with many people that God had called me to the mission field. As God would have it, Gary was called to the mission field. He had a desire to plant churches and to teach in a seminary. In the following months, our dislike for each other turned to love. We were married the following June. After graduation, we moved to Secretary, Maryland, our first summer there, three ladies came calling, not to talk to Gary, but to me. They wanted me to apply to teach school in Dorchester County. I protested, they insisted, I applied. And you guessed it, I was accepted. That was the beginning of 36 years of teaching. Dean Reynolds was right. As always, God was in control. While in college, I had many times prayed, asking God not to send me to Africa, not because I was afraid of being killed, but as a city kid, I was not in love with the idea of living in a remote village. When we were accepted as candidates, our assignment was to Indonesia. I'm sure many people back then thought of Indonesia as a country of many villages, which it is but it is also a place with large cities. We were to live in Mawang, a city of 500,000 people. Hardly the village I was afraid of living in. Again, God was in charge. Before we could be accepted as full-time missionaries, we were assigned to Missionary Internship, a year-long training program for prospective missionaries. In May of 1971, we graduated and were commissioned but there was a holdup in our visas. We were impatient, wondering why the delay. The mission sent us to Cornell University to attend their Indonesian studies program. That summer was a time of learning the language and culture of our new home from Indonesian lecturers. Yes, God used what seemed like a delay to prepare us even more for the ministry ahead of us. Our classes ended on a Friday. On the following Monday, we received word that our visas had been granted. God in charge of visa granting. Since then, in our many moves overseas and in the States, I have witnessed God's spirit continuing to lead us. Several years back, Gary and I retired to Easton. We visited here at Royal Oak Church, felt welcomed, and decided to, this, to make this fellowship of believers our home. You brothers and sisters in the faith have certainly supported me in all that has happened since our move here. So, back to Psalm 71. Since my youth, you have taught me. And here comes the words that smacked me in the face. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation. And then verse 24. My tongue will tell of your gracious acts all day long. 
I had always assumed that my teaching school, teaching Sunday school, VBS, and leading various Bible studies was my part in telling of God's power and actions to future generations. Teaching seemed to be my lifelong gift. Then came Pastor Josh's request that we complete a spiritual gifts assessment. Well, I'd taken a few of those over the years and wasn't expecting any surprises. However, I was certainly surprised. I'm not going to take the time here to discuss my results, just to say that teaching did not come out as my highest number in the assessment, not anywhere near the top. Another unexpected result was that the gifts with the next highest numbers under my new gift were supportive of that high number. As Pastor said in his sermon on unwrapping our spiritual gifts, the gifts are given to us when they are needed, and those gifts can change as they are needed. They can even lead us outside our comfort zone. Perhaps the Spirit is leading me in a new direction. As a friend of mine would say, you think? As Psalm 71 taught me, it does not matter our age, position in life, where we live, our physical abilities or limitations. God is faithful to walk alongside us, to be with us through the Holy Spirit as we experience the troubles and joys of life here in his creation. As a witness for Jesus, I have not always been the most vocal individual. I have attempted, though, to live as a faithful believer. I would challenge all of us, myself included, to serve search for what God would have us do in our everyday walk. Perhaps take the assessment if you haven't already. If you have, look for ways to fulfill what God is telling you through the gifts you've discovered. The book of Romans chapter 12 is chock full of positive ways to do something. One of my favorite verses in Romans 12 is, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Let us all be faithful in prayer as we seek to follow the Spirit. All of us can get out and do something. Give a smile, a hug, show up at a school game or play, visit in a nursing home, give words of encouragement. I know that God will show each of us how to find our personal way to be the salt and light in our community as the Spirit leads us. Brothers and sisters, children of God, just as God has loved you and been with you from the very beginning of your life, he is with you still, loving you, desiring that you love him back. As you leave this place this morning, God goes with you. Go out, share his love, do something. Amen. And in response,